The dawn of a new season of Futurama is coming to Hulu July 29th. That's great. But I have to warn you, it's completely brilliant. The interplanetary hit is back. The very survival of Earth is at stake. Is everybody okay? Is anybody hurt? Nobody's okay. Everybody's hurt. Watch the all-new season of Futurama. That's the best damn show I ever saw. July 29th, streaming only on Hulu. Watch Team USA during the Olympic Games with Xfinity Mobile. Stream every record-breaking moment with fast Wi-Fi on the go. Get the fastest connection to Paris with Xfinity. Proud partner of Team USA. Learn more at Xfinity.com slash Team USA. Restrictions apply. Available in select areas. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home. Welcome to Worlds on the Verge. This is Zach Spedden's win, as always, by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And on tonight's episode, we reopen our mailbag to take questions from our listeners about all things Orioles. And on tonight's episode, we're going to break down the potential playoff rotation, what the Orioles might or might not do at the trade deadline, the recent draft, and for some reason, we're going to be talking about the Hall of Fame. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But first, Orioles on the Verge is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything online sports betting. Right now, you can receive a 50% free bet of up to $250 on your first deposit to bet on anything from the Olympics to baseball to Formula One racing. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with, o- or one, with one of our over 150 slots games. Head to the website today get in on the action. Use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to $250. Bet online, the game starts here. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, we have a lot to get into in the mailbag and really a wide range of questions. And I'm going to just jump right in with this question from Catch a Beat, who's going to be making an appearance a few times in tonight's episode. He wants to know how much confidence on a scale of 1 to 10 do you have in an in-house option to start game three of a playoff series? So in other words, can't just grab random pitcher that's available right now in the trade market or even someone down in AAA. Looking at the current options, would you trust any of them to start game three of a postseason series? Start with Bob. No, not really, no. <laughs> um, I think I would actually trust Albert Suarez the most, uh, even more than Dean Kramer. I just, he gives like DGAF energy, so I don't know if he's going to be really uh, bothered by the playoff atmosphere. I just think he's more of a in control of his emotions. So I think he's just going to pitch how he pitches. And yeah, like Vivek says, maybe it is more of a quote unquote bullpen game, even though he's been a starter most, most of this year, maybe he's like, uh, you know, he can give you three, four innings. Then you can look at Povich or I don't know, whoever's available at that point in time, McDermott, McGow, whoever, if, if we have to go solely in house, but yeah, I don't really trust Kramer. Um, or Suarez, or Povich, or Irvin. So, yeah, got to acquire that Game 3 starter. Yeah. Uh, to answer Dental Office's question there in the chat, uh, I am vibing on some uh, Swishy Pants beer from uh, Dewey Beer Company. Uh, if you guys want to sponsor us, Dewey Beer, uh, your beer is fantastic. Um, I am going with, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, I think I'm going to be nice and say a 2. Like, I... I want to trust Dean Kramer so bad. Like I, I do, but I, I just can't. And I don't want a rookie in that spot. I would like for Grayson Rodriguez to be our number three. Uh, you know, maybe if a scuba or a crochet is acquired, but that would be ideal. Uh, but yeah, if, if it's, if 
either of those guys are not going to be the option, then I would like someone who is like they've they've been in the playoffs before. They've been there. They've done it. They know exactly what to expect. I would much more prefer to have that than a uh, Kramer. I, I like the Suarez point. He's probably not going to let things phase him. Uh, he's going to be pretty happy just to be in that situation. But yeah, I'm I'm going to say a two and being kind of generous with that one, I think. I didn't give a number, so I'll say two and a half. Yeah, I'm going to land on a two also, and I think I've been one of the bigger defenders of Dean Kramer, um, at least on this show. But yeah, I would not want him in game three of a postseason series right now. And I'm, I actually would take Suarez over Kramer. The problem is that Suarez is already at 70 in the third innings this year when the most he's ever thrown in a major league season is 84. So I don't know what we can expect from him in terms of length when the postseason comes around. So I absolutely think that the Orioles, and we'll get to this in a little bit, do need to address the rotation. And whether that starter or starters is in there in game two or game three of a series doesn't really matter to me, but it's clear that you're going to have to have something behind Corbin Burns and Grayson Rodriguez because you can't count on being up 2-0 in a series and have to turn the ball over to someone in game three when the momentum could swing the other way if things go bad for you. Yeah. It's, I, I know Lance Brzezowski has written a lot about Dean Kramer this year, about some real changes he's made, but it's just like I'm still waiting for the results to like really wow you um, to trust him. As, we'll go here to the next question, though. From Ben, here's an absurd question. Ben's wording, not mine. Um, but, you know, how many future Hall of Famers are on this team and if you want to expand, who makes the Orioles Hall of Fame on the current team that's not Cooperstown bound? Let's start with Zach on this one. Of the current roster, Corbin Burns is the closest thing to a Hall of Famer. He's not a lock yet, but he's certainly on that trajectory. He's got a Cy Young Award. He's been a very good pitcher to the stage in his major league career. If he continues to pitch well into his 30s, maybe wins another Cy Young Award down the line, he's going to get into the Hall of Fame. I have to like what Adley Rutzman and Gunnar Henderson are doing in this early stage in their career, but I'm not quite there yet on them being Hall of Famers. However, Orioles Hall of Fame, sure, they will be there um, of the players on the active roster. If Cedric Mullins can rebound at some point before his tenure with the Orioles ends, I can see him in there as well. So those would be three that I would say that Mullins definitely won't be Cooperstown bound. Rutzman and Henderson just aren't at that threshold yet where we can talk about them in that way, but I could see them getting into the Orioles Hall of Fame. Oh, and then there, another point here, Craig Kimbrell, as a comment on YouTube, John brought up. Yeah, Kimbrell probably is going to make the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I was going to say there's five obvious ones. You know, Adley, Gunner, Burns, Kimbrell, Keegan Aiken. So it's just... No, the four obvious ones. And then... Which Hall of Fame are we talking about? <laughs> well, I, that wasn't specified. But um, if you're talking Orioles Hall of Fame, Henderson, Rutschman, Mountcastle, Santander, Westberg, Mullins, Kowser, Kerstad, maybe Hayes, maybe not, uh, Rodriguez, Bradish, Kramer, <laughs> Orioles Hall of Fame. I mean... In 20 years, half this, more than half this roster will be on there. So but Santander is a lock. I don't know how I miss him, but yeah, Santander definitely will be there. Yeah, I, I would say, especially if Santander is extended, he's an Orioles Hall of Famer. And if Mullins can rebound, like Zach said, he is an Orioles Hall of Famer. Kimbrell is for sure an MLB Hall of Famer. Uh, Burns, and then yeah, the other two obvious ones. Gunner and Adley are trending towards potential Hall of Famers. Like, if Gunner can win MVP, Rookie of the Year, and then MVP, or even if he comes in second place this year, and let's say Aaron Judge wins it, I think that's going to add a lot of fuel to Gunner's fire, which is dangerous. And like we said before, we we haven't even seen peak Gunner yet. That's not viewing this through orange color gla- orange color glasses. This isn't just because we're Orioles fans doing an Orioles podcast. I genuinely think that we have we have not yet even we can't even see the ceiling with Gunner Henderson. Uh, so he's certainly trending that way, but. Yeah, it'd be cool. Santander is my favorite there. Like, man, extend this guy. Let's keep him around for a little bit longer. I'm going to keep pushing that train. Yeah, I'd at least like to see qualifying offer extended and maybe he accepts it. That would be ideal. Keep him around for one more year. 
let him get paid a decent amount of money. But uh, next question comes from Catch a Beat again, and he says, assuming it costs less than a Tariq Skubal or Garrett Crochet prospect hall to acquire him, should the Orioles trade in division and bring Kevin Gaussman back? Zach? I'm inclined to say no just because of some of the health issues and some of the regression that we've seen from Gaussman this year. I give him a lot of credit for the way that he's pits in the last few years, but you look at some of the data this year for him, expected ERA 5.14, fastball velocity, just not that impressive anymore, typically 93.9 miles per hour. Chase rate and the walk percentage are still good, but everything else, it seems like hitters are squaring up on him more this year. He's not throwing as hard as he has in the past, so it's debatable whether he's even the pitcher on the Blue Jays that the Orioles would want to acquire at this stage. So, you know, I think that there, you can get a better pitcher in that tier in terms of prospect return. If you give me a choice between Gaussman and Eric Fetty, I would probably take Eric Fetty over Gaussman in this stage. Yeah, I love Gaussman. I will still watch. Uh, I know I shouldn't say this uh, on an Orioles podcast. I will watch Kevin Gaussman starts when he's not playing the Blue Jays. Uh, when he's not playing the Orioles, uh, I will watch Blue Jays games sometimes if Gaussman's pitching. Um, I, I love the guy as a prospect and glad he's found success in the big leagues. But I think for the haul that it would cost to acquire him, I how many more years of control does he have? I, I don't know that off the top of my head. Two after this year. Two. Yeah, like it's a no for me. Like Zach said, the fastball below is down. It's down across the board. I'm pretty sure he entered the year with like shoulder issues or concerns. There was something at the very beginning of the year. And if you look at his savant page, it, his four seamer had a plus 16 run value last year. It's negative three this year. The split finger was a, a plus four run value last year. It's now negative three. He's getting barreled more than ever. That's been trending up significantly year over year for like the last four years. I, I just don't know if I can trust him for the rest of that contract. And you're going to be paying a very big price that could, I'm all for giving up big pieces is we're going to talk about probably in a minute. I'm all for giving up big pieces. You got to trade talent to acquire talent. But like I, it's the trust factor with Gossman. I don't know if it's there, and that it's an interdivision trade, and that talent could really haunt you for years to come, and that's going to really hurt if Gossman, you know, something happens to the shoulder, he doesn't pan out for you, he doesn't help you, and that trade ends up being a major bust. So. I'm actually not sure if it would cost that much if baseball trade values is to be believed. His value is zero like his salary and surplus or there is no mm -hmm. surplus his value and his predicted stats or whatever they run uh, measured out is equals out to zero so i would happily send uh errol robinson or logan reinhardt over to the blue jays to take that salary off their hands as long as we also acquired another pitcher as well i wouldn't mind him as like a reclamation project as an older guy but I agree with, with Garrett in the chat. The Blue Jay pitcher I would prefer is Yusei Kikuchi. Even though he's been struggling lately, I, I just like his stuff from the left-hand side in Baltimore. We'll go to our next question now. Sticking with the um, trade deadline, or actually going in a different direction here with the draft, uh, with this front office is propensity to take position players, if the O's had the first pick in 2023, would they have passed on Paul Skeens to select Dylan Cruz? That comes from Billy B. And I'm going to throw a layer of complexity onto Billy B's question. We have the draft lottery in place. It's been in place since last year. Let's suppose that the Orioles, 83 and 79 in 2022, just like what happened in real life, they were draft lottery eligible for 2023. Instead of landing at 17, they land at 1-1. 2023, they're in the same playoff chase that they were in real life. Now they're going to draft 1-1 and push for the playoffs at the same time. Does that factor into the front office's decision? So I guess it's really a two-part question here, and a good one, but I'm going to just throw that on to it. Changes my mind uh, when you add that extra layer. Um, and it, I this is not also it's it's extremely hard. It's almost impossible because we're watching what Paul Skeens is doing in the major leagues right now. It's phenomenal. Uh, I I I love it for baseball to see a young guy like this succeeding so early. But my original answer was no, 
just because maybe you save some money by taking Skeens over Cruz, which is what I think the Pirates was a major factor for the Pirates. Uh, Cruz, I imagine you would have had to give a little bit more to because he was the expected one. One, I think you got Skeens for you were able to shave a little bit off um, his signing bonus. But that elite SEC up the middle bat, Team USA success. Uh, shout out to the MLB Draft Discord chat. Uh, Team USA. Uh, power speed, defense, just an unbelievable prospect. I don't think it would have been a terribly difficult decision. But when you add that extra layer on, I do wonder if you maybe you know push a few extra chips in and say, maybe this guy could be an asset for us. Uh, even if he's not the Paul Skeens we know today, that's a bullpen piece for you uh, for the playoff run. So that does change my mind, though. I think, I mean, I'd love... The dawn of a new season of Futurama is coming to Hulu July 29th. That's great. But I have to warn you, it's completely brilliant. The interplanetary hit is back. The very survival of Earth is at stake. Is everybody okay? Is anybody hurt? Nobody's okay. Everybody's hurt. Watch the all-new season of Futurama. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the best damn show I ever saw. July 29, streaming only on Hulu. Watch Team USA during the Olympic Games with Xfinity Mobile. Stream every record-breaking moment with fast Wi-Fi on the go. Get the fastest connection to Paris with Xfinity. Proud partner of Team USA. Learn more at Xfinity.com slash Team USA. Restrictions apply. Available in select areas. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home. I'd like to say that they would take skeins there, but... I don't. I don't think so either. I actually think they would have taken Wyatt Langford and saved even more money for later in the draft. So I'm going option C, Wyatt Langford. Those were both good choices. I had thought about Langford. Ultimately, I feel like they're going to stick with Cruz because it fits the model of up the middle player who's kind of five toolish. And I think Dylan Cruz is going to have a really good major league career. It's just that. Paul Skeens has ascended at a rate that few prospects before him ever have. And he's going to be a good pitcher for a long time. But I think Cruz is going to hold up. And as for what the Orioles would have done, I don't think a pennant race last year would have changed it because even if they had drafted Skeens, I don't think they would have brought him up to the major leagues considering how they use some of their didn't use their college pitchers coming out of the draft last year. I think that Skeens probably would have started this year in Norfolk and would be in the majors now, and he would certainly make this team better, but I don't think he would have changed the course of last season. Draft revisionist history is uh, fun to think about, especially the later you go on. But next question comes from Chris Resitar on the most recent draft class. He's asking, do you guys find it at all interesting that a guy like Nate George, who was, what, the 16th round pick? It's in the question. Uh, keep reading. Uh, who seems to be getting a lot of hype went in the 16th round, despite clearly communicating an intention to sign a pro contract. Yeah, there was an article before the draft, I think came out from a local paper where he gave a quote that said his, he had every intention of going pro. And if he wasn't drafted, he was going to go the Juco route. That's why he, I think he was committed to a D one school and then decommitted um, from that right. But like two weeks before the draft, I don't know. Do you guys find it at all interesting? Do you like the Nate George pick? Um, thoughts? I like the Nate George pick. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, I'm sure he was just excited. He wants to be a professional baseball player who doesn't when they're growing up playing baseball. And just because he gets drafted, he says that if I get drafted, I have every intention of signing. That doesn't mean <laughs> that there might not be a number that he's wanting or hoping to get there. I, I don't know. Maybe he was in communication with a team already, and it was like, if you're there, we'll take you. Here's what we'll give you, a ballpark figure, and he was just excited. I don't know, but I'm I'm happy to have him. I'll say that. I'm glad he's in the Orioles player development system, no matter which round he's in. I hope he signs, and I was also uh, happy to see that DJ Layton expects to sign, um, intends to sign before August 1st as well, so... It's a little interesting, but it, ultimately, I don't think it really means much as far as how good he is or is going to be. 
There's no question that George has a lot of interesting tools, his speed, especially he's a very athletic player. And from everything I've been able to read and Nick, I know you broke this down on the day three recap last week. It seems like the makeup with him is really high. So you take out two things that could be a factor otherwise for him causing the drop, which is signability concerns and makeup concerns. When I look at him, though, I do think that he is really raw at this stage. And in that sense, I'm not surprised that he fell to day three. Joe Doyle, in his pre-draft report on him, noted that there are some questions about the hit tool. I found that from other sources as well. And he, all, Joe Doyle also pointed out that his defense, even with his speed and his arm, still probably a little rough around the edges because his routes to the ball aren't always very crisp. That's something a player development system can fix in no time. But when you look at the questions about the bat, I don't think it's terribly surprising that he fell to day three. I could have seen him as a back-end day two pick, but I don't think it's terribly surprising that he fell to day three. That he fell as hard, that he fell as far as he did in the day three, the 16th round, I would have thought he would have gone a little bit earlier, but I don't think that there's much to it because he is a raw player coming from a cold weather state in the Midwest. And then by comparison, DJ Layton, there's some questions about his game, but he's coming from a baseball hotbed in the Southeast. A lot of reports really like his defense. So is a, there's a reason why I think Layton went day two, whereas George fell to day three. Yeah. Could just be how the boards shook out. Like I don't look, I don't see anything with it, to be honest. Different teams value different traits. And Zach mentioned some of the pros and cons there with George. And clearly, I think the Orioles uh, were just higher on George than other teams and decided to take a shot, roll the dice there with high schoolers. You didn't see a lot of high schoolers taken in this draft. It's fewer and fewer. So I like it. Do we, I guess we'll stick with the current draft question there. From Simpkin says, Brecht, Brody Brecht, Iowa right-hander, went 300K over slot. Does that explain why they didn't pick him? If you watched our live stream, <laughs> we were we were getting excited because he fell to 32 and everyone saw our extreme disappointment when it was, oh, Griff O'Farrell um, and not Brody Brecht. Uh, love you, Griff. But yeah, I don't know. Do you guys think that played a role in it? Money is a big driving factor in this draft. Or do you think it was the control issues? Do you think the Orioles just said that's too much? I mean, it's impossible to know, but I'm sure it yeah. played some factor. I mean... You know, you saved some money with Hoferro. If you would have had to go over slot there with Breck, that changes the whole, the whole trajectory of the board. Probably a combination of things, but I'm I'm sure it played a factor. Yeah, I think it falls somewhere in the middle because three hundred thousand over slot is not that big of an ask if you really like the player. But I think the Orioles, you know, they got their target in Vance Honeycutt. I don't have any doubts about that with their first pick, and it's going to take slot money to sign him probably. But they could have trimmed somewhere further down the draft that they had really wanted Brecht. And I think that maybe they just were really worried about the command concerns and they saw reliever risk there and that kind of backed them off. So it could be a combination of the two. It could be the bonus demands and it could be that they just weren't as high on him as we were or maybe some in the industry were. Yeah. I mean, they, they did draft the, the three high school kids. So I wonder if like were those... Like, super high priority targets for the team and they wanted to make sure they had a few extra dollars. I don't think either the Nate George or I don't even remember the kid's name, the last high school kid they drafted, to be honest. Um, Whitaker. Whitaker is his last name. I it from North Braylon Carolina. Whitaker. Braylon Whitaker, North Carolina. Um, shout out Colgate uh, for Garrett. Um, I don't know. I don't see either of the high school kids getting like huge bonuses, but if again, if those are high priority targets, you probably just want every dollar you can get. So, All right, move on to another question from Catch a Beat. He says, going into the 2020 season, terrible season for many reasons, no minor league baseball, very shortened baseball schedule, COVID. 29-year-old Garrett Cole received nine years, $324 million, which came out to $36 million per year from the Yankees. Given the rising cost of pitching since 2020 what could corbin burns who turns 30 in october command this offseason nick i have no clue but i will pass along these two numbers i found i don't know if you guys saw these as well uh these came out before the season started one from the athletic 
they did a projection series about what contracts could look like for guys on expiring deals. And the athletic put seven years, 185 million for Burns. And then Dan Zimborski over at Fangraphs a couple weeks later, uh, he put out an article doing the same thing. And he looked at eight years, 210 million. Yeah. So I don't know, take those numbers for, for what you will as a baseline. I will add that the caveat in with the higher annual average value has come with shorter term contracts for players like Max Serger and Justin Verlander. That hasn't been true across the board, but we have seen that trend in the last few years with pitchers. And I wonder how if there's this part of Burns that wants to be the guy that goes out and gets seven, eight years guaranteed, as opposed to a three or four year contract that's going to be worth 40 plus million because he could easily get that. I, I think you would find a lot of teams willing to give him three years, 42, 44 million to pitch for them. But when you start to get into that seven to eight year range, it becomes a little bit more complicated. All that said, when we had Danielle Allen, Tuck and Andy Costco on the show back before the season started, Danielle had written about this point and used Garrett Cole's contract as a baseline for what Burns might command in the off season. And we talked about it with her on the show. And I do agree. I think that he's going to aim for something around the Garrett Cole contract, maybe a little bit more average annual value, but I think the years are going to be a factor. So I wouldn't be shocked if the AAV ends up somewhere between what Garrett Cole got and what Justin Verlander got from the Mets a couple of years ago, which was $43.3 million, or the $42 million that Zach Wheeler is getting from the Phillies. But I suspect that the year is going to be a big priority for Burns. Yeah, those numbers, especially from Zaborski, seem a little light as far as the AAV yeah. goes. I, Yeah, I mean... I'd give him seven years, two hundred and thirty-five million, but it's not my money. Um, yeah, I think he'll probably end up getting like eight years. Let me do some quick math: eight twenty, eight two eighty, like thirty-five million a year over eight years. I I could see him getting something like that, and you know, maybe the Orioles say, "Hey, we're rich now. Let's do this." <laughs> but I I tend to doubt it. I think they'll just offer him the the qualifying offer and take the draft pick, and hopefully fill his spot at the top of the rotation somewhere else, whether it's at this trade deadline with Terry Skubel or Garrett Crochet, or if it's someone else in the off season. And that's a good segue here. This question from bird is a word. If you were Michael Elias, would you be willing, what would you be willing to give up for Tarek Skubel? Or who would you be willing to give up? And I'll start with Nick here. I go back and forth here with this one. It's because I I don't anticipate Corbin Burns being an Oriole next year. I don't think the Orioles did when they acquired him. Uh, and if you go out and you get a guy like Scooble, who is, they are clearly having discussions, you know, questions about, have discussions already you know, dissipated with, when it comes to Scooble, and they've worked their way down to other pitchers on the Tigers roster. Don't know. Um, but you can't argue that he has been one of the premier pitchers in all of baseball. Uh, since he returned from his injury. I really don't care. No, let me think about that. Erase that part. I I don't want to push all the chips in, but I think Jackson Holiday is off the table. And if you want Mayo and Basayo, I think I'm out, but I would be willing to go Mayo or Basayo plus pretty much whatever you want after that. Like Build a big package, but as long as Holidays off the table, and the Orioles keep either one of Mayo or Basayo. Give them pretty much whatever else they want in terms of like prospects. Uh, if we start talking about like Kirschdad Westberg range, that that gets a little hairy, a little bit more difficult, I think. Um, but if you're talking about just prospects, yeah, I, I I would be willing to part with that. I just I I go back and forth on how aggressive I want the Orioles to be with this deal because I really want Scoble. I really want those when when Burns is gone next year, like there's your ace. Because if Burns is gone and you don't trade for the ace this this trade deadline, do they have to? No. It would be huge to go Corbin Burns, Tariq Skubel, Grayson Rodriguez. Who else is touching that playoff rotation? That's lethal. Um, then of course the bats are gonna go cold for that one week. They just need to not go cold and it's all be for nothing. But like I, I just look ahead to next year and if Burns is gone, like 
who's your number one starter going into the offseason? Dean Kramer? Like, <laughs> it's rough. Bradish isn't coming back next year. Burns not being back. Like, I don't know. So that's part of me is like, let's go, let's go hard for Scooble. But I don't see the Orioles being super aggressive there. I also love Scooble. Would love to have him. At the same time, I'm just not sold that the Tigers are going to trade him. I don't, I don't necessarily see it. They don't have to do it right now. He's under control for two more years after this year, unless they're nervous that he's going to get hurt again and they want to strike while the iron's hot. But personally for me, I'm just not willing to trade our top three prospects. I'm not willing to trade Holiday May or Basayo. I think they are elite prospects that we would regret if we lost them, even if it is for a great pitcher like that. But what I would be willing to do, and I will preface this by saying, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think the Orioles are going to trade a guy that is a big contributor to the current major league lineup because it kind of, I don't know, defeats the purpose in a way. But the most I would be willing to do is headline with Jordan Westberg. And I love what Westberg is providing for the Orioles. I just think he's a little bit of a regression candidate. I'm not sure he's going to continue to keep up this level of production going forward. I think he'll still be really good, but uh, I think he's got like a 120-something WRC+. plus. Um, He's only walking 5% of the time. I think there's a little too much swing and miss to his game. I'm just much more confident in Holiday Mayo, Basayo, even Kerstad at providing value at the bat. And obviously Westberg is a a good base runner. He's good in the clubhouse. He's a great defender at second base and a little bit less, but still pretty good at third base. So love the guy. But for what it would take, I would lead with him. You do Westberg, Connor Norby, Dylan Beavers, Enrique Bradfield and their pick between Cade Povich and Chase McDermott. And that's as high as I'm willing to go. Realistically, any discussion with Tarek Skubal is going to have to start with one of the players in the top three of the organization. So Holiday, Basayo, and Mayo. And I'm okay with that, but I cringe every time I see a hypothetical trade scenario between the Orioles and Tigers for Tarek Skubal, where the Orioles put all of the chips on the table to get one guy. To me, you're just setting yourself up to fail if you do that. So if Damn I can fair. put in Holiday, but we're not talking another prospect until we get down to the Judd Fabian tier of players, I would do that. But I'm not giving you Holiday and Mayo. I'm not giving you Holiday and Kerstad. I'm not giving you Holiday and Cade Pilbitz. There's a line there for me because for as good as Tarek Skubal has been this year, One of the things to consider is that the Tigers are trading him with a lot of leverage. They don't have to trade him. And not to mention, we've talked about, you know, innings totals a few times as trade candidates. His career high in the season, 149 to third. As Bob mentioned, there is a little bit of an injury history. So if you're concerned long term about how he's going to hold up, that's got to factor into what you're willing to get back. I would absolutely include one of the top three, like I said, but. From there on, you've got to play a little bit conservative. You can't just throw all your chips on the table in one trade because you want to get him because Corbin Burns is going to leave in the offseason. This is not how you should do business. And I think that I would be a little bit more restrained in my approach where, okay, you're getting the best prospect in baseball in Jackson Holiday. That in and of itself is a great return. Here's the rest of the players we're willing to part with. Or you're going to get Kobe Mayo. You can plug him in your lineup right now, and he's going to make your team better, and he's going to make your team better for the next six years. Good for you. Again, let's pull back a little bit and go down to the Dylan Beavers and Judd Fabians of the organization where we start talking about who else is going to be included in that in this deal. Yeah. It, I don't want to buy it. The dawn of a new season of Futurama is coming to Hulu July 29th. That's great. But I have to warn you, it's completely brilliant. The interplanetary hit is back. The very survival of Earth is at stake. Is everybody okay? Is anybody hurt? Nobody's okay. Everybody's hurt. Watch the all-new season of Futurama. That's the best damn show I ever saw. July 29th, streaming only on Hulu. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. 
But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home. Tiger's jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Baseball America had an article out too. I think it was released today. But just reading the, the the preview tweet over the last ten years, only two prospects ranked in the top ten have been traded before the deadline: the A's shortstop Addison Russell, who's number five in twenty fourteen, and Cubs outfielder Eloy Jimenez, who was number five in twenty seventeen. Jackson Holiday is not getting traded, like point blank period. Um, Mayo's twelve, but Sio's sixteen on Baseball America's list. I also have a very, very hard time. I would personally part with one of them, but I don't see the organization parting with either of them. And yet someone else made a really good point too in that, and I think this was a Tigers fan, um, when looking at all the reports, take them for what you will, about the Dodgers and Orioles, right? When it comes to Tariq Skubal and the Orioles having an advantage, one thing the Orioles, I think, have an advantage on a lot of other systems when it comes to deals there are a lot of prospects outside of the top, the big three. They have a lot of very near or a lot of major league ready or very near major league ready prospects that a lot of other organizations like can't compete with. Like the Dodgers, a lot of their top prospects are in the low levels of the minor leagues. A lot of Connor Norby, Dylan Beavers, like Judd Fabian, a lot, Dylan Beavers and Judd Fabian should be in AAA right now. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of talent backlogged on that AA roster that should be in AAA pushing for major league time already. That could be a huge advantage for the Orioles, I think, where you don't have to deal from the top three and you should be able to land. This isn't just like, you know, oh, we're giving up too much for this guy because like we value our prospects more. I think they genuinely could command a pretty decent return with these lower lo- lower ranked prospects. Yeah, and I can certainly see the argument for giving up one. I can't see the argument for more than one of the top three, but I could see the argument for giving up a holiday, a Basayo, a Mayo for a guy like Scooble. I think it's just personally too, uh, too risky for me. I- I'll take the, the risk averse position player prospect for six or seven years that I think has an elite bat, uh, over an arm that could get hurt in any moment. And yeah, it could be the thing that pushes you over the edge, but at the same time, the playoffs are a crapshoot and you might have, Scoobal has a bad start. Offense goes cold. Like I'd rather trade lesser prospects, which are still going to hurt to give away a guy like Beavers, Fabian, et cetera, but even Norby. But I'll, I'll take the rentals for a cheaper price and then uh, pick my battles later when look at 2025 in the offseason and see how we can improve there. Here's the thing. You still have Corbin Burns at the top of your rotation going in the playoffs as long as he stays healthy. You could get Eric Fetty and improve your playoff rotation. If that's a concern, you don't have to trade for Tarek Skubal. Um, you don't have to trade for Garrett Crochet. Would I like to see one of those two guys in an Orioles uniform? Yes. But for the purpose of long-term planning, it might be better to be in that tier for an Eric Fetty type as opposed to the top of the market for two pitchers who, frankly, might not even be traded. Completely agreed. Yeah. I, don't, I like that. Rep- I know take the dollars for what you will, but you know the the Reds trading off their expiring contracts. You're not getting Nick Lodolo. You're not getting Hunter Green. That this that's a fun young team in Cincinnati. Injuries hit them hard this year, but trading off the expiring contracts makes a lot of sense. And then you got Rock saying, "Oh, there were scouts at uh, Del Marva this weekend." I know scouts are everywhere right now, but like I, you want one of those guys that they've got up for trade for Braylon Tavera? See you, Braylon. Like. <laughs> Pretty much anyone on that Del Marva roster for a proven major league arm to even tell don't the touch thing. Aaron Estrada though, please. Personally. That one, that one's a little iffy. I get uh, like Juan Rojas and um, I was there's another pitcher I was thinking of. Yeah, let's keep that. Uh, but Jorge Lopez trade <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, they're like two pitchers on Del Marva that I'm keeping, but like pretty much anyone else. You want Braylon Tavera? Um, you want Anderson De Los Santos? Love you, guy. But um, see ya. Like you make those kind of trades, will that be enough to help get you through? I, I don't know. 
I don't know. I that I think that's where the Orioles are going to end up going, and a lot of people are going to be extremely pissed off. Acquiring Yudis Mordan and watch your Twitter mentions explode when he takes a little <laughs> bit too long to get around the plate on a home run. So think about that, Cincinnati, if you're uh, listening to this. We'll go now and we'll wrap up this segment because we have to shout out something really good that happened in the minor leagues last week, and that was Aberdeen's combined no-hitter, a 4 to nothing win over the Wilmington Blue Rocks. Zach Fruit started things out for the Ironbirds as they used four pitchers to complete the no-hitter. Fruit went four and two-thirds innings before being followed in relief by Davey Cruz, then Preston Johnson, and Kyle Verbitsky. And it was a great night for Aberdeen's pitching staff overall. And in addition to no-hitting Wilmington, they struck out in a combined 11 batters while walking just three. And Johnson in that department had the best night of anybody, fanning five batters in two innings of work with no walks al- allowed. So congratulations to the Ironbirds and these four hurdlers on their excellent performance against Wilmington last week. Zach Fruit is getting ripe. I think he's getting better and better as the season goes on. You better promote him to double A before uh, he gets too ripe. And I don't know, some kind of fruit metaphor. Um, Preston Johnson, I'm very interested in him. I think he's going to be a breakout candidate for next year. Another year removed from Tommy John surgery. I think his command is going to get better, or at least his control. Strikeout stuff has been there all year, all year round. It's just been kind of like Kyle Bronovich, you know, not the command that you would expect or want from from a guy like him. But hopefully that will continue to improve as he gets further away from surgery. So, yeah, it was cool stuff. Uh, Verbitsky, he had a lot of success in Aberdeen last year, and nice to see him be a part of this as well. Yeah, I was going to say, like, a pretty awesome moment for all those guys. Fruit, because he's a very young, promising prospect. You know, started out strong, had a tough month of May. Kind of cooled off, but you know you're making tweaks. You're you know it's first year of pro ball. You're in high A. He's been stronger than ever in July. Uh, 14 innings, two runs allowed, 13 strikeouts, just three walks. He could end his first year of pro ball in Double A and as like a, a top 30 French top 30 prospect in this organization. And he was a ninth round pick out of Troy last year. Davy Cruz, like shout out Davy Cruz. It's been a brutal year. The walks are through the roof. Uh, he's clearly just the the mop up guy, you know. When the starter can't make it out of the third inning, Davy Cruz is there to get the final out. That's his night, and sometimes he walks four guys before he gets that one out. That's all he needs to do. It's been a tough year, so good for him to experience that. I agree. Like Johnson's essentially making his pro debut this year. Drafted in twenty twenty two, had Tommy John surgery, so he missed twenty twenty three. Beginning his pro career in high A. Strikeouts have been there, like Bob said, just getting his feet wet after missing a full year. So I'm on board the 2023. He could be pretty uh, intriguing. Wouldn't be shocked if he's like a, in a piggyback role in Bowie to start the year. And Verbitsky, yeah, like fantastic year in Aberdeen last year after coming over in the with Cole Irvin in the Dale Hernandez trade. Started the year in Bowie and did not go well for him. Got demoted to Aberdeen. So at least he starts off the, uh, the the second portion, the final stretch of the season here uh, as part of a no-hitter. And shout-out to the catcher behind the plate, Adam Retzbach. Uh, yeah, shout-out to all those guys. And if you guys have anything about that, I want to shout-out the DSL All-Stars real quick. We didn't really talk about that. I, it was actually like a 2-2 game. Not a ton happened. Uh, not too interesting, but uh, it was... I already lost the tweet. It was 2-2 tie game because... I don't know why they just can't get a winner. It's a DSL All-Star game. I'm just vamping, trying to find the guys here. Jordan Sanchez made the game. We've talked a lot about him this year. Cuban outfielder the Orioles just signed. He went 0 for 2. Uh, and then it was shortstop Elvin Garcia, who we've talked about a couple of times as well. OPS in over 1,000 this year with more walks and strikeouts. He went 1 for 1 with a single, I believe. And then Henry Tejada made the All-Star game. Uh, Tejada... Pitched 0.2 innings, gave up two unearned runs, had a couple strikeouts. Uh, so shout out to Henry Tejada. Kind of interesting because Tejada missed all of 2023 because he was suspended for a performance-enhancing drug. <laughs> um, and now he's a DSL All-Star. But uh, shout out to those guys. We'll go with one last question on the night. A late entry into the mailbag here before we wrap up, and it comes from Kevin Mack on YouTube. Do you see any promotions this week, or do you think they'll wait until August? And that, of course, means minor league promotions. I kind of expected some out of the All-Star break. And then I thought, all right, well, maybe they're just going to wait till 
the Monday after the All-Star break, but usually we would have heard something by now, I feel like. So, yeah, maybe they are waiting till till August 1st area after the trade deadline, like we said, kind of clear some of that elite talent pipeline blockage at the top and then let things kind of coast up as they should. Yeah, I think that's why we were talking about this before we even went on air tonight where – it's just there's so much talent top to bottom through this organization that the promotions have definitely been stingy this year. And, and you know, hopefully we see those uh, trickle in before the end of the year, for sure. Yeah. I mean, like I said, Enrique Bradfield Jr. should be in double A, but hard to get him playing time if he were to move up. Judd Fabian and Dylan Beavers should be in triple A, but triple A's got Stowers, Hudson Haskin, Billy Cook on that outfield up there. That's a crowded outfield. I think it's probably wait and see between trades, who gets moved, who doesn't, um, who they can move to the development list, who gets cut, because it, depending on how many guys, as they start to sign the, these draft picks, if they get added to Delmarva's roster, well, someone's got to either be put on the 60-day IL or go to the development list or with this roster limit. So I, I think we're gonna it's going to wait and see, get all the draft picks signed, let the trade deadline pass, and then do the shakeup from there. And also FCL promotions will count against that number as well. Mm-hmm. So maybe we don't see as many as we would like to just for that reason alone. So, yeah. yeah, if you listen to the show every week and you're thinking to yourself, how come you know we're not hearing as much about promotions? It's not just you. It really has been slower this year compared to previous years. It's been about two months ago, we had a whole episode devoted to recent pitcher promotions. Outside of Matthew Etzel going from Aberdeen to Bowie, I think it's been really slow. And even that move came on June 11th. So it's been a while since we've had a notable promotion within the minor leagues. I agree with you guys. I think that probably either next week or the week after, we'd start to see some promotions get through the trade deadline. More draft picks sign, more undrafted free agents sign, although the Orioles have already signed plenty of them. And you're going to start to see some cuts. You might see some guys go on the development list, and it's going to clear the backlog up a little bit. You're still going to have a handful of players that you look at these rosters at the end of the year, and you're like, how is this guy in that level for that long? It's inevitably going to happen, but things are going to loosen up here. Yeah, I just want to argue with Simkin real quick. No obvious FCL promotion candidates. I disagree. Edwin Imparo, Miguel Rodriguez, Ellis Cuevas. They deserve to be in, in Delmarva when this, once the season ends. But we can talk about that more next week. There's also just a lot of, with the FCL to Delmarva thing. Like Who from Delmarva is going to go up to Aberdeen? There are a couple of pitchers I could see Estrada. moving up. Estrada. <laughs> but like outside of Estrada, like... There are a lot of guys who are very young for the level. I think that's another thing, too, that's hindered some promotions. We've kind of reached this point where, like, it's okay if Basayo spends a few extra weeks in Bowie because he's 19 years old. Like, I think you're seeing that at all levels. There's a lot of guys who are extremely young for their level. And so it's just, it seems like they're taking extra time down there. So I don't know. I could potentially see Creed Willems to double A, Mordon to high A, and then Miguel Rodriguez to low A. That's iffy. And who knows? We might have more to talk about next week. But one thing we know that we're going to be discussing on next week's show is the trade deadline because we're going to be on Monday night, one night before the July 30th trade deadline this year. So you're not going to want to miss that. We might be breaking down trades that already happened, happen, discussing trades that could happen or won't happen. So you're not going to want to miss that. And we've been known around deadline time to do an emergency podcast or two. So keep your eye out over the next week because if a big deal does go down, all three of us or at least one or two of us might hop on and give you a bonus episode. And where can you find that? You can find news about that on our many social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Threads, X, YouTube, and TikTok. We're also over at Substack and OriolesOnTheVerge.Substack.com. And if you sign up to become a member of our Patreon community, you get bonus daily coverage from Bob. Nick and myself, that kicks in when you sign up to the $5 level. At the $3 level, you'll have a shout out on this show, access to our bonus Discord channels, and more. And who knows? Maybe if there is a bonus episode in the next week or so, patrons will get it first, or they'll get a little bit more insight there. We'll have to see. But that's all to learn here in the next week or so. In the meantime, 
For Bob Thalen and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to Orioles on the Birds, presented by Bet Online and part of the Believe Podcast Network. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home. Hey, it's Michelle Beadle. That's right, the Michelle Beadle. You're welcome. You love talking about sports. I love talking about sports. You know the only thing cooler than talking about sports? Sports! And right now, all your favorite sports are on Sirius XM. I'm talking every NFL game, every game from the NBA, NHL, MLB, every NASCAR race, golf major, major conference college sports, and all the top games in the WNBA. If it gets your heart pumping, it's on Sirius XM. So start your free, free, free trial of Sirius XM today. Visit SiriusXM.com slash believe.